welcome friends to this two day event in toronto i am very happy to be back in toronto after some time and i'm very glad to see all of you here seekers of the ultimate truth seekers of our true home such kind you are all here because you are seekers and the secret to finding our true home is to seek if you seek you will find it is that simple but we do not seek we search there is a big difference between searching and seeking we search with our minds and we seek with our soul we have two things in our consciousness in our head our soul and our mind both work together but most of the time we do not know what is the difference between our soul and our mind i want to tell you the fundamental difference between our soul and our mind and how their functions are different and separate if you can know that difference you will always know when is your mind functioning and when is your soul functioning soul is life if there is no soul there is no life all life anywhere in this universe is created by the soul soul is a unit of consciousness soul is a part of god soul is what makes us conscious of everything that is happening around us we get to know this world we get to know each other we get to find our houses our properties and all the trees animals insects living around us they are all discovered by us because we are alive and have a soul all other living forms also have souls plants have souls insects have souls mammals animals have souls birds have souls angels have souls so called gods of creation have souls nothing is alive without a soul so soul is basically our life mind is created to use life in a different way life is life and does not need any time or any space it functions independently of time and space whereas can you all hear me thank you life works independently and the mind is something given to life to use every living form has a life and it also has a mind the soul is the same in every living form no matter whether it's a tree or a little plant or it's a human being or it's an angel or it's a god soul is the same in every one mind is different in every one the mind that lower species have is very minute very little small and functions in a very limited way as evolution has brought about higher species the mind has also grown and its fullness is experienced when we are human beings the mind stores information it's like a computer it carries data from all experiences we have had it also creates something else more important than the data of experience it creates our destinies our destiny is of three kinds destiny we are born with which in our own indian language we call it pralabdh karma pralabdh means we were born with it in that all the incidents that will happen in our life from birth to death are already recorded all events that will happen during that life like accidents meeting people where we are born who will be our parents who where we will get training where we will go to school where we will get jobs who we will meet 
how many people we will meet everything is recorded in our fixed fate destiny called pralabdh then there is a destiny which we make during our stay here in the physical world that is when there are gaps between the events already recorded in our destiny then we create new events by using what we call our free will our free will is exercised when we have a choice to make if there is no choice it is part of problem when there is choice it is a new karma being created and those we call the karman karma or the one that will be making through action through intention through decision making and those new events that we make become the foundation of a pralabad pralabad that means the destiny of a future life sometimes they can be the foundation of something that is to happen within this life this cycle of old and new keeps on going in every life it's only a human being who has the chance to make a choice not only instant your choice which is instinctively made instincts make choices immediately but deliberation and thinking in the mind is different new karma is only created when we think in our mind and deliberate say should i do this or that should i go this way or that way is this a good choice or that's another good choice only when we think like this we create new karma not otherwise if there is no choice it is pralab and previous destiny we are brought at birth so that is why these two separate the kind of karma we have one is a pay off from the past previous karma and karma previous decision making we did in past lives is creating the destiny for us in this life and the new karma we create by thinking and deciding things creates the karma for the future but since it is not necessary to do action to create a karma even when we think about doing something we create karma karma is not on the body it is not in the sense perceptions it's only in the mind the mind creates karma the mind pays off the mind is responsible for the whole game of karma the mind which has been given to the soul to use for experiences here creates this karma and stores it and then applies it and we play it again in future lives so this is a very significant part but since intention can create karma and we are intending to do so many things in our head which we never really come created to action karma is still being created in one lifetime we can create so much karma there is no way it can be paid off or settled in one future life therefore lot of excess karma surplus karma is created in each life that again is stored in our mind and that is third part of karma separate from the pralabd or the destiny we are born with separate from the karma and karma or the new we are creating with intention and action here therefore it is stored as a separate storage a reserve karma and we call that sinchit karma sinchit is a storage so the sinchit karma is stored and every life we add more to the sinchit karma because we create so much extra that we cannot pay off in one life so that's a huge storage we are all carrying in our minds when a new life comes and we do not have enough karma to create a full life then karma is picked up from the sinchit from the reserve to create a new life if somebody says i will lead a karma free life i will not make any decisions i will go with the flow like they say so whatever the circumstance i'll just follow them without decision making just by what others are deciding i will follow what circumstances are saying i will follow i'll have no karma a new life can be made completely out of sinchit karma this the storage of sinchit karma is so huge in each one of us 
it can take millions of lives to clearly clear that that is why this karma is one of the biggest traps created here that our own mind which was given for usage here has created something that is tying us down to this physical reality forever we keep on getting born and reborn and trying to pay off karma and it never ends because the storage is so heavy this storage of karma is not somewhere else it is in our own mind sometimes people think that our mind is just like our body and is created with the body and dies with the body that is not true the mind has a much longer life actually there are three parts of the physical astral and causal universe there's these three parts and they represent three functions in our body the physical part is our physical body made of matter then there are sense perceptions like seeing touching tasting smelling these are sense perceptions they work through the body but can also work independently for example in imagination we can close our eyes and see what we imagine that is also see in imagination we can do all these five things without use of the body therefore the sense perceptions are a separate thing from the physical body and we call the sense perceptions if they work separately from the body as our astral body or sukshma sharir that means a very fine why do we call it sukshma or fine because it has no matter in it only sense perceptions that is why if we imagine we are somewhere else we are using our sense perception we are using our astral self or sukshma sharir some people think it's a separate body it's not a separate body it's the same sense perceptions that are working right now in this physical body can be separated and they become the sukshma sharir or the astral body all sense perceptions are intact along with the mind along with the soul if it doesn't have a mind doesn't have a soul it will die just like physical body if there was no soul will die if there is no mind it will die if it will have no sense perception it will die so these are all dependent upon each other the outermost body we have with the physical body contains the sense perceptions therefore it contains within itself the astral self it also contains within itself the mind the mind is also a body we call it causal body karan sharir that means it causes all experiences to happen nothing is happening here which has not been caused by your own mind the mind is the creative power of every experience in these three worlds it is a very important thing the power of the mind to create is immense and yet the mind will only be alive if there is a soul sense perception will be alive if there is a soul this body will be alive if there is a soul so soul is giving life to all these three but the duration for which these three last is different this physical body does not last too long in terms of cosmic time we talk of billions of years that this planet has been here our life how much it is even is 100 120 years long people don't live more than that recently and science has proved that one cannot live more than 125 years because of a particular sequence in the dna that prevents us that growth is automatic aging is automatic and we can't live more than 125 years so that is why it's a very short period in terms of total time the sense perception inside lasts longer it was there before we were born same sense perceptions have come into this body the astral self is still the same the mind is still the same it comes again and again in different forms of life so when we say the sense perceptions we are talking of a longer life body inside this that was there before we were born in the physical body and will be there even after we die some people mistakenly call it the soul atma my soul is dying and will go to another body soul does not go anywhere is only these created forms that transfer when the astral self transfer to another body 
It's the same astral self and the same mind that was existing in the previous body. That is why it carries in the mind all the sinchit karma, all the reserved karma, and carries all the pralabh created from the karyaman karma and the sinchit karma for a future life. It's a very interesting thing how reincarnation takes place. It's worth studying how these elements are picked up that create a new life. Now that is very interesting that the life of a human body, maybe some people don't even live hundreds, some people don't live eighties, people die at different ages and hardly some people go to hun- over hundred. So it is a very small part of life. The inner body which is sense perceptions or astral body or suksham shari has a life between 1000 and 3000 physical years. It is born and stays on for thousands of years. Therefore, it can have many bodies, many forms of life during its one life. That is why the sense perceptions can even remember what they saw in previous lives. And we see something, say, it looks like we have seen it before. We have deja vu and we have experiences. Similarly, we have experiences of other senses. We feel we have had earlier. We smell something, a new flower. I have smelled this long ago. I can't remember when. It need not be in this life at all. It could be a previous life. Because the sense perception of smell is the same that was there in a previous life. The mind on the other hand, which is carrying all this sinchit karma, and the creator of karma and the payoff of karma where it takes place, the mind has an even longer life in terms of physical time, it is between three and five million years, one mind. It is called a causal body, karan sharir, because it is also covering the soul. Whatever covers the soul, we call it a body. So three bodies are covering our soul. Soul is life. Soul is consciousness. Soul gives ability to see things and ability to be conscious of things. Even if you can't see, consciousness per se, is the soul, it's a unit of consciousness. And that is why there are three bodies covering it. The causal body, which is our mind, with several million years of life. So it keeps on revolving with other astral bodies and astral bodies keep on revolving with other physical bodies. It's a continuous game going on of life. So that is why life takes place, not for a little while. Life comes for a long time and it works through these three bodies, the mind, the senses, and the physical body. So the mind has a long life, and that is why it can carry our sinchit karma, it can carry regular karma, it creates our future life. So this is a very interesting thing, that it should be possible for something sitting in our head to create karma forever, because there is so much reserve karma we have stored. This is a very big trap, the biggest trap. And this trap takes place in time. Supposing there was no time, there will be no karma. This takes place in time and space. Time and space are both created by the mind. If you go above the mind to the soul itself, that means where life is coming from, there is no time and no space there. They are created at the level of the mind so that our experience can be divided into cause and effect, the law of cause and effect, into karyaman and pralabd, into division of something we are creating with our thoughts, with our decision making, and something we are paying off also in our mind. Though the payoff may be something on the body, like you have pain in the body, The pain is not being experienced by the body. The pain is being experienced by your mind. Supposing you take an anesthetic, the same thing does not cause pain. The mind has been trained not to have the pain. Similarly, if you are unconscious, you can't have the pain. Body is still the same. It's the mind that suffers. Mind enjoys pleasure. Mind enjoys pain or suffers pain. And that is why this suffering and this enjoyment which comes in this life of human life is all in the mind. And we think it is on the body because it is being expressed in the outer covers which are the 
सूक्ष्म शरीर एंड स्थूल शरीर और फिजिकल बॉडी एंड द सेंस परसेप्शन बॉडी दैट इज वाई इट्स वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट टू नो द नेचर ऑफ द माइंड वॉट इज द फंक्शन ऑफ द माइंड द बेसिक फंक्शन ऑफ द माइंड इज टू थिंक दैट इज वेरी बिग फंक्शन टू थिंक इज द ग्रेटेस्ट फंक्शन ऑफ द माइंड टू डू विच आर थिंकिंग ऑल द टाइम ट्वेंटी फोर सेवन इट इज लाइक द हार्ट बीट ऑफ द माइंड सपोजिंग वी स्टॉप थिंकिंग वी विल डाई माइंड विल डाई senses will die we will die mind never stops thinking some people think oh we can control our mind there was a friend of mine when i was studying at harvard university a friend of mine was studying the nature of the mind and he said i have found how to stop thinking i was very impressed that somebody has broken the old rule the rule was mind can never stop thinking here is a friend of mine who says he has learned by some special method how to stop thinking which means to still the mind and i had heard some yogis in india telling me you have to still the mind before you can get enlightened i never believed them because i say the mind is a function which cannot be stopped and therefore thinking goes on it only shifts to some other levels so i invited my friend to my apartment i said will you please come and demonstrate to me how you can stop thinking which means you can completely still the mind so he came i said how long can you do this he said with my asanas and with my practice and with my breathing techniques i can do it for half an hour i said if you can do it for one minute i'll be very happy to understand it half an hour is too long if you can do it for one minute i will believe you can do it forever that's a very big development in my knowledge so i said let us do demonstrate to me for one minute so i said i will give a clap like this you start let me stop thinking after 1 minute 60 seconds i will keep my eye on my watch after 60 seconds i'll give you second and you start thinking again then you tell me what happens to human consciousness what happens to awareness when the mind is not thinking at all it's a very big piece of knowledge the greatest knowledge for me to understand that so he got into a very special kind of a position in the body contorted himself and had deep breath and he's almost stopped breathing i said well maybe that he can do let's see the next part so i gave a clap like this and i looked at my watch allowed 60 seconds to pass and i gave a second one and he opened his eyes and he was fine i was happy he was alive and then i asked him now this has just happened a few minutes ago i just want to know what happens to a human being when he is not thinking at all my first question is when i gave this clap like this how did you know that's the time to stop thinking i said is not a conjecture speculation is memory just try to remember what actually happened when i did that and he said now i remember when i heard the clap i said in my mind this is the time to stop thinking i said that looks like a thought to me he said that just took one or two seconds i said all right we'll now say the experiment was only for 57 seconds now tell me after you said that in your mind how did you know if you were not thinking how did you know that when i give the next clap you can start thinking again don't make up a story just tell me what you remember and he remembered after i said this is the time to stop thinking i also said 
in my mind and I will not think again till he claps again. So it looks like a thought to me. A very short story to cut the story short. I said, then what happened? How did you know? This thought kept on all the time. And he was thinking for all the 60 seconds. And he put his hands like this. He said, I can't imagine that when I thought I stopped thinking, I was thinking all the time. I said, I'll explain to you why that happened. I'll explain why you thought you stopped thinking and why you were actually thinking. The explanation is very simple. Our mind does not think in one channel. Have you ever noticed people do their simran, their jap, their mantra with the mind? And the mind is re repeating those words. Another voice, thinner voice says, are you doing it too fast? Which is that one? One, one level of mind is saying that you are repeating words. Second mind is commenting upon it. If you try carefully, a third level will come up. There are as many as eight levels of thinking mind. Just because he thought that the level at which he was doing his mantra, that had been silenced. The mind had been silenced. The mind was saying those other questions that I asked him all the time. So that is why it is not possible to stop thinking. Thinking is the heartbeat of the mind. And that is why the mind thinks all the time, whether we are awake or asleep, whether we are conscious or unconscious, in the physical self, is continuously alive by thinking. So main function of the mind is to think. And thinking is very important. What we think makes us who we are. What we think is the generation of our life here. We make our life with our thinking. And that is why what is stored in the mind and comes as problem which thoughts cannot create. Because we don't know, thoughts don't tell us which our parents will be, where we will be born. That is not created by thought. Nor does thought create an accident that happens. Nor does create a thought of meeting a stranger by chance and saying, I know you from a past life. Nor does thought create all these coincidences that happen. But thoughts do create new karma. Thoughts do create new karma when you have to use thoughts to make a decision. That is why thinking is very necessary to continue the process of karma because problem has been created by previous decision making. So this is a very interesting thing that we are using our mind for thinking. That is not the only function. This is the basic function that means it cannot live without it. But there are other functions put in the mind. One of the functions placed in the mind is to doubt everything. It is very wonderful. It's a good function. If we did not have the capacity to doubt, if we did not have skepticism in us, we would believe anything anybody says. There is no screening allowed. Therefore, the placing of this special function of creating a doubt was a very good thing in the mind to screen our experience and build faith on anything after screening. So doubt is essential. Doubt is essential. But there is one trouble that along with doubt comes fear. So that is both added in the mind. Fear is automatic. When you doubt, you get afraid. If you have no doubt, you will never be afraid. So doubt creates fear. And these are built into the function of the mind. We are using a mind, all of us, with our life, our soul. And using a mind that experiences all karma of the past, present and future through the sense perceptions and through this physical body and screens things through doubt and some fear. So this is a very interesting setup. The soul has no doubt. Soul has no karma. Soul has no time and space. Soul is life without all this. Soul uses the mind to create all these experiences. So we can have several types of experiences at different levels. We will be alive if we did not have this body. 
when we die we are alive but not in the physical form but in a form that uses the same sense perceptions we are using now when a person dies looking back and not gone anywhere it's just a disembodied spirit and disembodied spirit means it does not have matter in this body but the mind and the senses are the same soul same so therefore such a disembodied spirit we start calling them ghosts in india i remember we distinguished between two kinds of ghosts bhoot and preet bhoot is a disembodied spirit who could not complete what it wanted to do as roaming around it flies all over the world sometimes flies even beyond the world and those disembodied spirits or ghosts we call bhoot the others are called preet which means they died in their physical body by a sudden accident or murder or suicide and they get stuck to the place where this happened and can't move from there so this is the life of a person who is dead but it need not be in that state forever because the karma has created the condition for the next life and that is why they will move into a next form of life based upon the karma of this life but sometimes you have to stay for a little time in that state what causes us to stay like a bhoot or preet after death is that body is died that is not died why can't it go into new body instantly the reason why it does not go are two reasons one the attachments we have had here the attachment do not let us go we don't even want to die at that time the attachments oh i could not meet that person oh my child will miss me oh so and so my brother is seconds i couldn't see him before i died i should have gone and seen him after death you will see him after death you will do that but not in a body brother won't see you the brother who was sick won't see you you will see the brother you will have the sense you can touch the brother brother won't feel it if you try very hard brother might feel i feel he will say my brother who died is still somewhere here people get that feeling because of the sense perceptions of the disembodied spirits still trying to make contact so our attachments here can keep us here longer second way we can stay for a much longer period is if the death is unnatural that means it is caused by accident or caused by murder or caused by suicide these are unnatural forms of dying and when we are born in a physical body and the astral body fitted into it we come for a notional life that means a life that could live and the interruption of this notional life creates these conditions of murder suicide or accident when you die like that then the notional life is already set earlier according to your pralab supposing somebody is born a normal life in the human body with its current health with the kind of conditions food it eats and so on would be 80 years at 30 years the person commits suicide for 50 years the notional life is still there the disembodied state stays on here to fulfill that 50 years so that's the second way that one can be stuck here and not be reborn again so these are things that are happening all the time can we verify what i am saying is it possible for any one of us to test out am i telling the truth or not all of you can test it out with one simple step just go into the astral body you will see the astral body roaming around now how do we go into an astral body to see the other astral body roaming around we die like that then we can see them or we can pretend deeply to die what is called dying while living all saints and mystics have told us the way to find the truth about yourself is to die while living in the bible it's paul says i die daily he does not mean physical death it's experience of death can we as living people 
create an experience of death when we like? Yes, we can. If you have seen people dying, you will notice they die in stages. Death looks sudden. If you see a terminal person dying, and I have seen many at my age, so many of my friends have gone, many of them I have seen in hospital while they were dying. When death comes, the whole body does not die at once. The dying person, while he is still able to speak, tells us, where are my feet gone? As if the feet have died first. He will say, will you place my leg on the right side? It is already the right side. He will make statements. You will know he is unconscious. He is not aware of his own legs. He is not aware of his own hands and arms. It appears when we die, the awareness, which is life in the body, is pulled out first from the extremities, hands and feet, arms and legs, and the person is still speaking to us. When he comes to the bottom, he says, am I flying? He's not flying, he's lost the consciousness of his bottom. The death proceeds from the bottom of the torso and keeps going up. The person is still talking to us. When it comes close to the heart, he can't speak anymore. And you can see his eyes are moving. He's trying to tell something, but can't speak. When the death goes further, when it goes to the head, the body is gone. Complete death. That's a process of death. Everybody dies like that. Some this process takes place very quickly. Some takes time. And you can, if you see people dying, they all die like this. Therefore, there is a particular way in which life or awareness is pulled out from the body. Now, here is a method by which we can copy that while we are still alive. And the method is, if what is pulled out at death is our awareness, let's pull our awareness the same way while we are alive. And the method is, what makes us aware of our hands and feet? If you study carefully, it is our attention. Our attention shows, is a continuous attention that's creating a body, we are, we are sure, we are aware of it because of our intention all over the body and from the body all over the world. Our, all our experiences are taking place in awareness because of attention. Therefore, the secret to having a real copy of death while we are living is to pull your attention. Attention from the hands and the feet. Attention from the arms and the legs attention from the lowest part of the body to the top. This can be done by correct type of meditation. Meditation means to meditate upon something. We are all meditators. We are meditating upon something or the other, thinking about something or the other all the time. So it's not a new thing. Meditation is thinking about something and putting attention on what we are thinking. That is meditation. We are all great meditators. Every day we meditate. But if you want to have the experience of dying while living, then the meditation should be where the process of death will end. In the head. That is why if you put your attention in the head, not all over the head, but at a particular point which appears to be the real point from where all the attention and awareness has gone to create life. That point. Where is that point? There has to be a point in our body where when you die, it eventually all the awareness goes there at that point. And when we meditate, put attention on that point, we get all the awareness back and we can see what death is like. Very simple method, only we know where is that point. When I was working for the government of India, a big important leader of another country came to visit India. He had an accident, got into a coma, became unconscious. So we had to take him to the best hospital. 
our hospital people did not know how to treat coma it was a deep coma for many days many weeks it lasted so we got the best doctors brain doctors brain surgeons from all over the world to treat that vip who was with us so the leading brain surgeon who had done more than 1000 brain surgeries he was checking that patient and the a political my political boss there he asked the doctor doctor tell me what makes a person conscious and the doctor said sir this question we have not been able to answer for thousands of years we still examining what makes a person conscious but we know one thing that we have a laser beam today which we can point at any part of the brain and when we point at the optic area the eyes can't see when we point at the oral area the ears can't hear there is a point in the head where we point that the person becomes unconscious so we have an idea that there is a point in the center of the head the most central part the most protected part in the whole body with the skull and white gray matter everything is so protected that is the point where when we put a laser beam a person becomes unconscious so therefore deep unconsciousness we think arises from somewhere there he said that is i have opened up thousand a thousand brains and i can tell you where that point is and i boss said can you explain in terms of anatomy where that point is he said in the center of the brain there's a little body hanging called medulla oblongata on top of that there are two glands very close one right in the center called the pituitary body and the other is called the pineal gland we think the pineal gland is very important because most of the body's functions all over are run by some ductless thing which doesn't carry duct ductless glands and all the hormones which go through these appear to be originating from there the pineal gland contains the power to control the hormonal function of all other glands we have a feeling that's the point and when we put a laser beam in that part of the body a person becomes unconscious hey scientists speaking like that gave some ideas where is that point he is talking anatomy but can we just as layman understand where that point is it's in the center behind the eyes if I, if you ask me as lay people no knowledge of anatomy can you explain what that where that point is i can explain very easily these two eyes draw straight lines behind these two ears draw straight line these two lines will cross the straight line there be small little place, place center of that is the place that easy to understand we know the point in fact that point has been given a name for hundreds of years called third eye center people call it third eye and i'll tell you why they call it third eye because we have two eyes the two eyes see two different things they don't see the same picture you know the, the 3d movies they make how do they make a 3d movie and they give us special glasses to see and things become three dimensional they take with a camera with two cameras one at this side same distance between two cameras as the distance between two eyes and they put two pictures on the screen and they give us glasses to combine the two pictures and we see one picture is done outside how are we doing it inside we are not using any glasses how are we seeing one picture when the eyes are seeing two right now we are all seeing one picture and the eyes are seeing two where are we making it one by focusing the eyes how are we making it one if somebody doesn't believe you are seeing two pictures you can raise your finger in front look at the distance there are two fingers one looks more real than the other or oh, everybody can see we have two different pictures 
and we combine them inside the same way like the glasses outside where is the combination third eye center same place it's amazing that we are day and night using the place and people are trying to search for a third eye is always being used at all wakeful state our consciousness is operating from that point therefore there is no problem at all in finding where we have to put the attention to have an experience of dying while living but that's the point where we already are therefore the method also is very simple we make it complicated we make it complicated by not realizing that we are at the point which we are trying to discover supposing i am sitting on this chair somebody says you have to find out where you are sitting i say okay i'll travel all over to find where i am sitting i am sitting where i'm trying to find out there's nothing to go anywhere so there was a song sung by a pakistani singer beautiful song somebody sent me the wording were is a multani song wording where it nahi te kith nahi if it is not here it's nowhere the truth is all here the very place where you think you are right now we don't have to search for it we create difficulty by our mind saying we have to go somewhere we have to make a journey to find our own self how do we need a journey to find where we are in the wakeful state we are already there all we have to do to find what we will be like after we die what we were like before we were born just put your attention and do another thing concentrate it these are the greatest gifts given to us by the creator attention and the power given the power to us to concentrate it wherever we like now supposing i would pick one of these flowers and hold it in my hand and i put attention on the flower and put more attention which means concentrate my attention on the flower what will happen after some time flower become more and more clear i will not know who is sitting there if i put all my concentration on the flower i'll see nothing but the flower that's what the teacher of arjun taught him when he went to learn about the bow and arrow to concentrate you will see nothing else but the target by concentrating our attention at the third eye center which is our self not somewhere else not find a place concentrating our attention on the self what will happen soon you will not know where your hands and feet are concentrate more soon you will know where your legs and arms have gone concentrate more you won't even know where your body is gone what will you find that the imaginative self that you created by trying to figure out you're there become the real and has all the sense perceptions all the thinking power exactly like this no body no material body you have reached your astral stage not a very difficult thing we make it difficult i have sometimes wondered why this teacher has taught very difficult way to meditate go to all the cycle of energy centers six chakras six centers go to the bottom do all kinds of meditation repetition of words do it at the lower center reverse the kundalini do this thing and then one by one step by step come to the heart chakra everything you'll find there if you can't go, go to the two petals lotus which is the eyes you'll find you start from here go down come back here what kind of enlightenment is that millions of people doing it and think it is yoga union with the self if you call it yoga as an exercise method i understand it it's good but to think that by putting attention on our energy centers we'll get higher awareness not possible i have done these things myself just to test out for 8 years i did every kind of yoga that was available it gives you energetic experiences it can give you out of body experiences still linked with this body we get so many wonderful experiences and then come back at the body to our reality physical reality 
They are not giving an astral body experience. None of them. So that is why astral body experience cannot be uh, obtained by heightening your energy, discovering new energetic channels. Energy is different from awareness. These centers below the eyes are all centers of energy. The power that makes us alive in the body, makes us run around, make us lo look at things. The circuits of this energy that are running this body and our awareness of this world. But this is all physical matter. It's not astral matter. There's no astrality at all in the lower energy centers. All the energy, all the awareness is in the head. It starts from the eyes, goes behind and above. I remember old story I have told many times, but some of you may not have heard it, that my master, great master, his picture is here. Everything I am sharing with you, I got from this man. All credit goes to this man. If my talk is helpful, credit goes to this man, not to me. It's all his teaching, his grace. He was, when he was alive, he was invited by my uncle, Ayaji, that means my father's elder brother, who was working in Karachi, which is now in Pakistan, then in India, in the weather bureau as a meteorologist. And he had a beautiful house on the Clifton Beach on the sea. He was very keen, great master, as we used to call him, would come and visit us and have a holiday for a few days. Great master agreed. And we, about a group of 14 or 15 people, is me included, we traveled with great master all the way by train to Karachi and stayed with my uncle. Now, my uncle in Karachi, they used to go to a Swamiji for Ayurvedic medicine. He was a good Swami to teach about the meditation in the lower chakras. He used to teach about yoga of the six chakras. And he also gave Ayurvedic medicines. My uncle and auntie, they went for Ayurvedic medicines. But like the Swami, because very beautiful face, lovely eyes he had. And he used to wear saffron colored robes. And he used to have a little scarf, saffron scarf. When he walked, he walked with great authority holding his scarf. I still remember. So, when great master agreed to go to Karachi, they went to Swamiji. His name was Swami Brahmanandji. Said, Swamiji, our guru, our master from Punjab is coming here and we would like you to go and have his darshan. Swamiji said, bring him to me, I will bless him. That's not what they thought the Swami will say. He said, bring him to me, I will bless him. So they were a bit of a quandary. Now what shall we do? We thought he will get blessing from great master. But he is going to bless the great master. So they arranged that a lunch will be held in their house. And they had a little sofa called love seat sofa, two seats. They said, we will seat the master and the Swamiji on that seat. So they'll meet each other anyway. So the day came and Swamiji arrived and they seated him on the seat. Great Master was in the bedroom. They called him to come. And Great Master came and they said, Swami, this is Swami Brahmanandji. We have been talking to you about. And Great Master folded his hand, bowed his head, and Swamiji raised his hand and blessed him. And we were watching all this. He said, this is a turn of events is very different what we expected. After some time, Great Master says, Swamiji, isn't it a pity that people seeking enlightenment are confined to the six centers of energy below the eyes and nobody is going into the higher 12 centers of awareness. They don't even know about the 18 centers that exist in this very body. Centers of awareness are 12. Centers of energy are 6. And people are confined to these centers of energy. 
he said master i never heard of these where are the seats where are the centers of awareness you are talking of we sometime here seventh center top of the head where are these other 12 centers you talk of he said have you not heard that there are six centers of anda six centers of brahmandas and such khanda you never heard i never heard that he said don't you think this is pinda the body physical anda the astral brahmanda the causal as such khanda of two soul he said, i never heard of this thing i would like you to explain these in some detail to me and great master said you know it's a very long subject and i am here on a temporary visit if you can come to my dera i'll certainly explain everything to you they left lunch was over swami ji could not sleep at night next morning he called he said i have to go and get the answers to these 18 chakras i never heard of i heard of six so he told his followers i am winding up my ashram and going to the dera in punjab i have to get answers he said something very strange about 18 chakras i never heard of them i am going to learn about the 18 chakras he wound up everything came to dera in those days i happened to be in the dera and get master given me little clinic because i used to practice homeopathy remedies and he had given me a small little place next to it he gave the place for swami ji to practice ayurveda he had arranged for that but when he came great master ordered that he should be put up in the best guest house he should be given the best attendants take care of swami ji and he can see me 24/7 any time he wants to see me a favor that we had never heard of given to anybody but swami brahmanand ji given that favor swami ji was speak treated so nicely attendants attending on him staying in the best suite in the guest house he felt very good he even pulled more on the scarf i remember then he walked nicely he tried to test if great master was right when he said that i can come any time so at midnight he one day said i want to see this see the master master had told his attendants if swami ji comes he can see me any time they woke up great master and swami ji went and great master said sir what can i do for you just came to say hello to you he said hello and he came back that this is true i am a vvip here then he attended the discourse of great master and great master said swami ji will sit next to me on that high dais high stage swami ji will sit next to me and swami ji was sitting next to him next day after the meeting after two days swami ji says master i have little problem when you speak and you talk about yogis and swami is only confined to this i have to listen to you very attentively and i am looking at you i got a pain in my neck great master said i also noticed that so therefore he said give him a chair in the front in the audience so swami ji moved from that big stage on to the floor on a chair after few days he said master i have little problem what is your problem now swami ji problem is that your stage is high and i am sitting so close to it to keep my head up like this all the time so it has caused me pain in the neck great master said, i also noticed it move the chair of the swami ji for 30 40 feet behind the middle of the audience chair went back after few days he says master i have a little problem what is your problem now swami ji problem is i sit on a chair people behind me can't see you can't have your darshan i feel guilty so i can't even listen to what you are saying i just keep on thinking about the people sir great master said, i also noticed that I remove the chair so there is swami ji sitting like anybody else there after some time he has to stand in line to see the great master one day we used to meet each other because our clinics were next to each other 
he comes to me, sits with me. He says, this master is a big diplomat. I said, why do you say that? He says, had he treated me like I am being treated today, I would never have come here, gone back. He put me as a VBIP. He gave me all those facilities. Now I realize I am like anybody else. But he has trapped me with his love. I can't go anywhere. We can never fully understand how these masters operate for the souls they have come to take back home. These are called perfect living masters. Perfect because while they are working even here, they are conscious of all levels of creation right up to such a true home, right up to the spiritual level. Not that they have seen it and come back to tell us. Those are other masters. They had a great experience. They come and share their experience. These masters, like Baba Savan Singh, whose picture you see, are perfect living masters. Even the physical self, their awareness is at all levels. That awareness, anybody can get. But it's a long process. I can explain that process a little long. But all I'm telling you is that the method of discovering the very next level of our existence, the astral level, if you stay there regularly for a little while, not only will you see that you can function in your sense perceptions exactly, if not better, than in the physical body. Supposing we are using glasses in the physical body to read. There you don't need any glasses. All sense perceptions are absolutely accurate at that stage. They are coming from there. We think these eyes are seeing. These eyes are not seeing. The power of seeing is seeing through these eyes. Power of seeing is different from seeing through these eyes. Because if the eyes were the only instrument of seeing, we could never see anything in imagination. When we imagine something, we see. In fact, images come into our mind all the time. You close your eyes, you are seeing something. The power of seeing is making these eyes see. And the power of seeing is the astral plane. Similarly, all other senses operate the same way. When we are able to withdraw our attention to the third eye center, in the center of the head, gradually we become unaware of the whole body. And we become absolutely clearly aware of our sensory perceptions as if they are our own body. Same shape, no matter, no material in it, no physical matter. As yet all sense perceptions intact, mind intact, thinking mind intact, memory intact. In fact, we discover something very interesting. That in that state, our memory improves. The physical body, it looks, not just very dense. To cover even sense perceptions, cover our mind, we can't even know where the thoughts are coming from. It's very dense. And therefore our memory is very limited. We can't remember what we ate last month. We can't remember our childhood except a few traumatic events. Their memory is sharp. We can remember the events of this body. And then we can remember, hundred years ago I did this. Hundred years ago this body wasn't there. You remember what happened a thousand years ago to yourself, not history. What you experienced, that memory can come back in the astral self, not in the physical self. Physical self, we have no idea of our past lives. A few people, few unique, unusual people have remembered past lives. And they are able to recount that what happened in the past. But they are very few. Most of us cannot remember anything prior to our birth. We can't even remember most of the events after our birth. So that is why memory is very poor in the physical state. Memory becomes very sharp, the astral state. But you have to be there in that state. That means people who meditate on the self, that means think about the self, concentrate their attention on the thoughts about the self. To that extent of concentration, they become unaware of things here, they can have that experience. It is not something confined to some people sitting in the Himalayas or some yogis and swamis can do that. Every one of us sitting here can do it. It's open to all beings, all human beings, no matter where they come from, no matter what the gender, no matter what the age, 
This is something already given to us. Somebody doesn't put it into our head. No human being is born to come this stuff to us. It's already in us. It's part of our heritage, part of our inheritance as a physical body. So that is why we are all able to do this thing, a simple method of withdrawing attention. If it is so simple, why are we not able to do it? Answer is also again simple. It needs you to put your attention in, in the mind that distracts you by its own attachments and desires outside. We have lived our life continuously attaching ourselves to other people, other things, other properties, other, this is my car, this is my house, this is my wife, this is my children, this is my friend. This my, 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 it's all creating continuous thinking about these things. That's the only difficulty. When we try to meditate on the self, these thoughts come and distract us. There's no other problem. These attachments are creating a problem. Then how do we solve this problem? Some people think we can practice detachment. I have never seen anybody succeed in practicing detachment. In fact, I have seen people, when they try to detach, they get more attached. I give my own example. I came to the United States and I loved a new pizza that was there called She Old Shaky's Pizza. Not too many places have that now. It is a popular place at that time. So I enjoyed that. I said, I am getting so attached to it, my meditation will fail now. I should not think of that at all. So I said to me, no more Shakey's Pizza. And more Shakey's Pizza came in front of me. A young man was giving a talk in India recently. And he was telling people, don't listen to anybody who uses the word don't. Well, first of all, he used the word don't. He said, if somebody says, don't tell a lie, you'll become a liar. He says, anybody who says, don't do bad things, will make you do bad things. You won't even think of bad things. Tell them, do good things. Tell the truth. That's different. But when you say, don't, the mind will act exactly to do what you're telling it not to do. So he gave a demonstration. There were 1,000 people sitting in the hall. He said, please close your eyes. And I'll give you an instruction. Everybody close the eyes. Don't think of your mother. And don't think her photo is in front of you. All thousand had mother and photo in front of them. He says, I told you don't. He said, this is the nature of the mind. When we try to stop something, it gets more into it. Therefore, those who try to detach themselves got more attached. That is not a solution for these attachments. What is the solution? Solution is get attached to something else. Shaky's pizza was there. I haven't even forgotten today, so I'm still attached a little bit. But pizza hot came. I forgot Shaky's pizza. Simple. We are loving people out here. If you fall in love with somebody inside, detachment is automatic. That's a secret. Therefore, the whole secret of removing the distraction of outside things, outside people, is to love somebody inside. Who is inside? Except yourself. Yourself is inside. We can't see. We close our eyes, we see darkness. Where's the self? Since we are never able to see inside, with eyes closed, we are still trying to see outside. Closing eyes does not mean you go on inside. We are still trying to see with these eyes, they are closed, we don't see. Not seeing is not equal to seeing inside. Since we can't see inside, our inside must come outside. Not everything. The one we want to love. If we have experienced love, and that being comes inside, we can love inside. Supposing we love another person, very deeply we love that person, then we can imagine that person and love inside. But 
as soon as we love the person's face inside the outside face comes up it does not stay inside so we have to love somebody who is inside and in a form that we can see we have made an arrangement for that when did we make this arrangement we don't know when we made the arrangement we made the arrangement when we were soul no mind no senses no body we made the arrangement if we get trapped in this business of mind and astral self and physical bodies and we get trapped and have to get out we should be able to get out the self should have some mechanism by which you go back to stu home what is the arrangement we made arrangement was that the soul will function to seek mind will function to search sensory perceptions will look out body will move in order to achieve our goal of going back to our true home i right in the beginning i said there is difference between mind and soul i said soul is without time and space mind functions only in time and space even the smallest thought takes time what does not take time let me tell you three things that don't take time at all even now in the physical plane first is the experience of love when it happens it's completely spontaneous and sudden we start thinking about it afterwards with the mind but love is not a mental experience mind can't create it it's a spiritual experience of the soul all love all true love not attachments all true love is spiritual experience the difference between that true love and attachment is in attachment we say i love my house i is very strong ego is very strong in attachment the i is always there when you are attached when you fall in love with somebody the beloved takes the place of the i i you begin to think of the beloved not of the i in fact love starts from the beloved not from the lover one persian mystic had said long ago ishq awwal dar dil e mashuk paida hamesha that love is first born in the heart of the beloved not in the lover lover is a response to beloved's love which comes spontaneously love is a spiritual experience of the soul second intuition we get intuitive awareness of something no thought i know this is going to happen how do you know i don't know how but i know it function of the soul all intuition is function of the soul and is timeless third function of the soul appreciation of beauty it's always sudden then we can think about it with the mind later but it's all sudden these three things and a state of bliss because of these three it's a very blissful state when you would fall in love blissful state beauty blissful state intuitive knowledge blissful state bliss is nothing more than the experience of the soul in these three ways so that is why the soul function like that how does the mind function thinking reasoning making sense of things using logic all kinds of logic inductive deductive and coming to conclusions mind is different both these things are happening in our daily life here some people tell me we are looking for a very easy way to become spiritual i give them the easiest way follow your intuition your hunch your gut feeling whenever it comes don't think whether it's right or wrong follow it let the mind carry out what you have decided you become spiritual what could be simpler than this you are dealing with the soul that's spiritual so intuitive awareness but we don't use like that if when we get gut feeling the mind says no no that's not possible 
most of the time the mind and thinking is in conflict with the intuition and there is a reason for it a scientific reason that the mind makes decisions on the data available to it at that time whatever it can know about this subject matter uses that it can't have all the data why does mind go wrong so often or next day we say oh wish i know that i wish i knew that that means data was incomplete the mind makes decisions on small element of data that's available to it intuition doesn't function with that intuition picks up everything not only from the subconscious not only from from this knowledge of mind from all past lives intuition works with a much larger data which we can't see because there's no time involved in that so it's an amazing difference between the two and we put the cart before the horse we say let me think about it and decide and got feeling okay let, let me understand it first trying to understand it destroys it we don't follow it if we were to follow our life intuitively you'll see your whole life change it become a spiritual life by itself you will appreciate beauty instantly love will be experience now when we want to have that experience of love spiritual love from within ourselves from the self and we can't see the self we have made a beautiful arrangement that when we are in human form and we are seeking to go back home what the requirement for seeking to go home why do we seek when we are fed up of this experience if we like it we are not ready yet enjoy it only when you feel this is not my place i have had enough of it that's a requirement if you feel this is not my place i don't feel comfortable here i know i don't belong here then the seeking will start and it comes at a certain time could after a million years could after one year depending upon the programming that we did before we ever came here to go back home when the time comes and we seek our own self projects itself just like ourselves another human being and that human being is not their human being awareness of our own self awareness of our own totality awareness of such kind of true home not aware at some time aware when that person appears in our life and that person we call a perfect living master he is just an ordinary person arranged by us to appear in our life when we are ready to go back home very simple here we think he is a different person we because we think all of us are different at the highest in our home we find we are all one we are all coming from the same source of totality of consciousness creating all the experiences of separation and many some people have asked me if such a beautiful thing was there we were all one what was the need to separate what was the need to become many this simple answer for that they say god is love atma parmatma prem hai love is the source of the soul love is the source of god god is love it is true our original self itself is love that's why we can experience love here because the soul is inside us if it is love and only love and only one it does not become a lover nor a beloved the manyness is created in the one to make what is there into an experience love becomes an experience of love through a lover and a beloved just by creating the many the very source of the many so if you study how this has happened and how we have covered ourselves in other forms so we can have love in many ways that's why we are here these statements i am making are only verifiable if you go beyond the astral body by meditating in the astral body by putting your attention in the head of the astral body you will open up your mind go in the center of the mind you will find the soul is there and the soul can only go through love to totality all are possible and our true home is where we are all one and yet many 
at the same time. That is a true home from where we have come for an experience. This doesn't look like a very good experience to many of us. If we merely had to generate an experience, why not create heavens everywhere and just enjoy heavens? Yes, heavens have been created for those who wanted only heavens, but they are not physical. They exist in the astral plane. Heavens and hells, both are there. They are being used to pay off the karma, very bad karma, there's a hell available. Very good karma, heaven is available right now. And we all go through those cycles. Why was this human form in a physical earth be created with pleasure and pain, with high and low? We all have that without exception. We all have good karma and bad karma in our destiny. Why was that necessary? A very good reason for that. If you had all good karma, you will be in heaven. All bad karma in hell. Then why have a combination? Because in the combination, you get a unique facility which is not available anywhere else. The ability to seek the experience of free will, the experience of making a choice. It does not exist in any other life form. In our Indian scripture, they mention 8.4 million life forms exist in this known universe. Jurassi Lakh, they talk about it. Out of that, the most intelligent part is 400,000 or 8.4 million. And the human life is only one of them. Out of 8.4 million, only one has the experience of free will. No other. Neither angels nor gods, they are all working on programs. They know everything, full knowledge. We are ignorant of the future. We think we have free will. Becomes an experience of free will. It's a big subject. Why we experience free will if everything is destined? We experience free will to have the experience of seeking, to have the experience of making a choice. And this we in introduced ourselves so that we can go back to our true home when we are ready for it, when we are tired of the experience. So that is why when we see a perfect living master, I'm not talking of all masters, all gurus, there are so many. There are more gurus than seekers according to my master. Therefore, it's a very big business nowadays. I am talking of those rare people, very rare people. Master used to say they can be counted on the fingers of the two hands in the whole universe. Those rare people are a projection of our own self. And when we meet them, a certain kind of love pulls us, which defies our thinking. Our mind creates the element of doubt and fear, and that love overpowers that. And we want to be drawn to them for some reason which is not known to the mind clearly. And that is what is the pull of love. And they do not really exist outside. We see them outside because we see everything outside. They exist inside. And they are our own self. That's a remarkable arrangement made. And some people say, my own self is my master. I said, yes. Do you see him? Do you see yourself? No then what good is it? This knowledge is no good if you can't even have contact with your own self. But if you see that self outside, you will see it. Well, the only way I can see, he said, is in the mirror. I said, the, you say to the mirror, shall I do this? And you say, yes, the mirror will say yes. You want to do something bad? You say to the mirror, I want to do something bad. Is yes, mirror will say yes. In fact, if you ask in your head without a mirror, ask your mind, should I do something bad? Mind say, okay, for one is okay. A human being sitting outside which is a true self will say no. Therefore, we need a human being like ourselves. Not only for that reason, a bigger reason is to have the experience of love which will alone pull us back to the top. When we experience love, from anybody, 
there is an element of devotion that comes automatically. That is why love and devotion go together. Experience of love makes you devotee, whether a person or God or anything, whatever sends you a message of love. People get messages from the soul, and they say something in me told me to come here and see you. What is that something? Your own self telling you time is ready to go back home. Why do we call these human beings who are just like us, ordinary human beings, just a projection of ourselves, perfect living masters? Because even as human beings, their awareness is not confined to the physical. What we try to find by meditation, the astral awareness, they are aware of it even as physical. What we call causal awareness, the awareness of mind, they have, have it even as human beings. What we call spiritual awareness, they have it even as ordinary human beings sitting with us. What we call knowledge of totality, they have it right here, whereas physically. And they are not unique. Any one of us can have that. It's all inside, not outside. But when we try to reach that state of totality, we go stage by stage. From here, we have to shut this awareness to get the inner awareness. To go higher, you have to shut that awareness to go to still higher. At one time, we only have one reality. We can go a little lower in a dream state. We go to sleep, have a dream. The dream remains real. We don't know where we are sleeping. We think we are moving around. It becomes real. Supposing in a dream, you come to know you are dreaming. What will you say? I know I am dreaming. You tell everybody, I am dreaming. You wake up, there was nobody to tell. Even the people there were part of the dream. Even speaking the truth about a higher level will still keep you the reality of that lower level. In physical plane, we can talk of everything. We are still in the physical reality. We experience only one reality at one time. Till we reach the top. Totality, we experience all realities and all creations at the same time. We have all the capacity to do this. But as it happens, for seekers, such a human being appears when we are ready. It's our arrangement. When we seek, appears. Not, is not found. In India, they say, when a chela is ready, a guru appears. Nowhere have they said when a chela is ready, he can find a guru. Only guru can find a chela. These human beings appear where there is a seeker for whom they have appeared. That means they not appeared for the whole world. They only appeared for those souls, one or more, for who, whose ultimate personality, ultimate soul, was seeking to go back home. So that is why each of these perfect living masters carries a list of the souls for whom they have come and become human beings. We call them the marked souls. I sometimes say there are two types of marked souls. List A, who they will take back in this very life and finish their karma, whatever debts you owe to this creation, to the law of karma, they pay off here. Little bit is left, they can pay off in a higher stage. And those who are not that completely ready, but get a chance to have an acquaintance with such a person, they are list B. That means they are seekers, but not completely ready in one future life, second, third, fourth, they will meet their perfect living master and taken home. This arrangement is all studyable, it's all verifiable, validated by going within. Everything I'm saying to you, you can, any one of you validate it. Just one step, go inside and find out. I am telling it's a great lucky day for those who have reached the point where they say, we are tired of this. This is not our place. We want to go home. A master will appear. How will he appear? How will he know? How will he appear in the laws of this world? He'll appear by coincidence, by circumstances. Somebody tells somebody, somebody reads a book, somebody reads here, 
circumstances will create and they appear in his life and how will he how will we find out that strange pull that takes us to him he pulls us beyond our mind i was telling in montreal yesterday about a professor and that intellectual professor he came one weekend to great master and he said master what you are teaching is not correct is all made up stories there is no such kind of true home this life is the only life we have scientific evidence that this life is the only life there no evidence scientific evidence that anything else exists why are you making a fool of people great master said professor you have a right to your opinion your experience is what you are telling me my experience is little different and we have a right to disagree because our experiences are different i i don't want to dispute what you feel is your experience your understanding mine is little different so the professor went away next weekend he was back and he said master i want to i have come back to tell you what you are saying there is no proof this is all nonsense you stop fooling these people they are just following you out of blind faith blind belief that's not good great master said i i agree that this is your opinion my experience is different and i am sharing my experience which happens to be different from yours so we have a right to have different experiences different opinions so i i i thank you for coming and telling me honestly what you feel but it's just a difference you 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 think of the way you like and it's up to you third weekend he was back again and he said master i have come to tell you the same thing again great master said professor last two weeks you came and told me the same thing now you come again what's the reason he says master i don't know but i want to see you <laughs> where is that coming from the most skeptic person and he became one of the best disciples a great master i remember the pull of a master's love is totally different from our thoughts thoughts bend when we can rationalize this pull and make it appear yeah i accept it the thoughts bend not immediately the doubt creeps in is designed to be creeping in every time you hear a master but the doubt disappears when you have either an experience in meditation if you have tried it in deep meditation if you try and have an experience doubt disappears so you say this is real what he was talking about on the real doubt also disappears if things start happening outside in life and see strange going i've just been saved from an accident must be master this thing was going to happen something stopped it who could have done it when these things happen we call them these are miracles who is responsible for this miracle and our mind then begins to associate with the human being he said master so these two in combination turn the mind which is an obstacle to meditation into a friendly friendly machine that works with us so that is why in life when we are following a spiritual path to go to our true home these two things happen experience inner experience outer experience that takes care of the mind and its doubt i'm very happy that i could come to toronto and share these experiences with you and they are not based upon any books maybe the books carry them i don't read too many books but they are based upon the experience of the teachings of this great master baba sawan singh i'll take a break now and see you about 3 o'clock again and if you have any questions and answers they may have pa paper and pencil will you please write them down i'll be very happy to answer your questions thank you very much